the Gospels probably, when they were originally written, didn't have names on them. Um, the Gospels are very similar to what we have in the lives of Aesop, where, where there's no author. Uh, at best, there's a title, but the, they're anonymously written. And the lives of Aesop are similar to the Gospels in that the, they're fiction, uh, they're, but they're about someone who's believed to be historical. Uh, they feature a similar character, this countercultural character who talks back to the religious elite of his time and um, it represents the poor and you know that kind of thing. Uh, and it has a similar storyline. You know, Aesop eventually ends up at the central religious city and is executed for uh, you know interfering with the the major religious cult. And so there's a lot of similarities, but also it has many redactions. Just like you have Mark, Matthew, Luke, you have all these different versions of the lives of Aesop, where they, someone just takes one version, changes it up, adds stuff, takes stuff out, and you get another version, and so on. Uh, so that's the closest parallel we actually have. And it's anonymous, so there's no author on it. And that's probably how the Gospels originally written. There's just no author named on it. John Dominic Crossan came out with a book called The Power of Parable, where he says, yeah, actually all the Gospels are just extended parables. They're not supposed to be taken literally, they, originally. Um, at least not by insiders. They might have been meant to be facades to take, be taken literally by outsiders, but insiders were going to be given the, the real meaning of it. And so this is how the story begins. And then, of course, decades and decades and decades follow. And then you get certain factions of Christians start selling these things as literally true and really anchoring their faith on the, them being true to the point that you get the creeds originally in Paul don't mention Pontius Pilate, don't mention Mary. They don't mention any historical details like that. But by 100 years later, you've got people like Ignatius insisting on, you better believe Pontius Pilate really killed Jesus and that Jesus was really born to Mary, or else you're anathema and we're going to kick you out of our religion. So it, be, it becomes obsessively focused on the historicity elements. So you have this faction that's really pushing historicity as a fundamental part of, this is the only way you can be part of our club is if you buy in to this being literally true. So you have this different version of the sect that arose about you know, 80 to 100 years after it began, and that's the sect that ultimately had the right guy in the right place to get the ear of Constantine and become the, the religion that was backed by the empire and then became the religion that dominated the West during the Middle Ages. Just a historical happenstance. So we got stuck with the historicist sect, but it didn't really start out that way. The word gospel isn't new. Gospel just means good news. Uh, it's actually, it, it is a political word that was used in inscriptions by the state and by uh, municipalities all the time. Like one of the earliest gospels is the Prien gospel, which is um, the, um, about Augustus, uh, the, the emperor coming in and saving them, and they write him about the savior figure, and it's, this is the gospel, yada, yada. But it's a political message. It's about, like, he's came and he saved us, he saved us and this is the good news and, uh, about this. So th this idea of a, a gospel or a gospel as a teaching, um, that, that's not new. That that's predates this. So the, the Christians co-opted that idea as something to market uh, their thing. So this is the true, and it is political for them, but it's uh, subversively political. Like their idea is not, uh, we want to militarily take over the government, um, or we're not going to come in and like militarily save you or anything. Their idea is like, we're going to spiritually save you. We are the spiritual government that you can just join, join this family within larger society. And larger society can go on as it is, ruled by the Romans, that's totally fine. But we will have our own society, and we're going to take care of each other. We'll have our own economy, and we'll have uh, make sure that the poor are taken care of, and we'll, we'll have our own justice insofar as we can realize it. And then, of course, when the end comes, that we will be saved collectively, and everything else get wiped away. Uh, so they're they're using this political terminology to sort of market the spiritual politics, essentially. Suddenly, sometime in the second century, probably mid second century, someone collected four of these together, and there are probably more of them around. But they, these were the four they collected and uh, named them. Uh, and we know it's probably one person did this because they used an extremely unusual, in fact, unique method of naming them, which is in Greek to use the, the kata structure, where they're, they're, they use the, the preposition kata and then the name, uh, which means according to, which is normally in ancient literature, everywhere else in ancient literature, how you cite a source, not an author. Uh, so you would say like, uh, you know, if, if Josephus was saying, oh yeah, I got this from this other guy that I read, he would say kata and the guy's name. So according to so-and-so, this is what happened. Um, it wouldn't be how you would name a gospel, right? So, um, so, so first of all, it's very unique and unusual to name a book this way, to actually have the kata as in the name and the title of it. Uh, but then suddenly you have all four are all named that way this, by this peculiar convention. So one person had to come up with this peculiar way of naming them, and, and clearly that means all four Gospels were named by one person, which means uh, they weren't named by the authors of the Gospels, right? So someone came along later and just assigned names. And when they did it, they didn't 
pretend that these were the authors. They're just naming them as the sources, as if like maybe someone dictated it or something. They're they're very vague as to what they mean by according to. Right? Like this this is our source for this text. But what do you mean by that? Doesn't say. Uh, so they but they just did this, and I think it was just sort of a, a way to sort of paper over the fact that these were anonymous gospels, and they wanted to give them names but not go so far as to just outright say, you know, lie and say that so-and-so wrote this. So they kind of had this sort of wishy-washy halfway saying that, halfway not saying that. But whoever it was, this one person came up with this idea, and all extant manuscripts that we have that have title pieces on it have the exact same thing. So it doesn't seem that any version that we have now came from any earlier version of the text. There were earlier versions of the text, but those are all, their ancestorship all died out. All the versions that we have now come from this assembled, edited version. Uh, that this one person or maybe a committee of people got together and built. And that eventually got stamped, rubber stamped as the canon, took a few centuries, but it sort of evolved into what became the canon. But it wasn't the first canon, right? So that that uh, collection of documents we know, which became the New Testament, we know was assembled in response to an earlier, the first canon, assembled by Martian. Uh, so a few decades earlier, he's the first one to come along and assemble some books and say, this is the official collection of books for Christianity. And then this competing sect, which became the modern sect today, or the ancestor of all the modern sects today, said, oh, hell no, uh, we're going to come up with our own in answer to yours. And then the original one vanished. We don't have it anymore. So we don't have Martian's original canon. Uh, we have this, this response canon that was built later. Um, but it was built by someone in the mid-2nd century um, and it wasn't like officially declared the canon until like several hundred years later, like well after the Council of Nicaea. Uh, but even by the time the Council of Nicaea was going on, which is about the creed, um, it was kind of de facto the canon. It was the way people were acting is that this was the correct collection of books. But the original one is gone. And so, uh, but yeah, so that's how these, these titles got on there uh, and how these names got chosen. Um, almost certainly the names were made up. They were chosen, you know, based on certain strategies as to what they wanted to say about that. But, um, yeah, so that, that's, uh, the New Testament that we have today is, is kind of like the, the fake second replacement New Testament <laughs> to the original earlier one. <laughs> Everybody knows that Matthew copies Mark verbatim and Luke copies Mark verbatim. So we know they're both just redacting Mark. But there's material in Matthew and Luke that's not in Mark that's verbatim between Matthew and Luke. And so we have this question, it's like, where is that material coming from? Because they're either Luke is copying Matthew or Matthew is copying Luke, or there's some other gospel that's lost that they're copying. So there, maybe there's some other gospel parallel to Mark and they're copying stuff from Mark and they're copying stuff from this other gospel and now it's lost and that's how they got built up. And this is where the Q theory originated. And that hypothetical lost gospel is, was named Q. It's uh, for the German quella, meaning source. Uh, so it's just this generic, this source document. They, say, they call it Q. And so whenever you hear people talking about Q in the context of the New Testament, they're talking about this, this hypothetical lost gospel. And then there's lots of debates as to when was that gospel written? Did it go through multiple redactions? Is it postmark? Is it pre-mark? Uh, you know, it's all of that kind of stuff. But there have been other scholars who've said, you know what, actually that hypothesis is not such a great hypothesis. Actually, it makes much more sense that Luke just copied from Mark or Mark and Matthew. So Luke is basically redacting Mark and Matthew. Matthew is Q, essentially, in this. Luke doesn't have a Q. Matthew's not using a Q. Matthew just added stuff to Mark, and, and Luke came along and then re redacted those, those, that material as well. Mark Goodacre is one of the leading proponents these days of that. So if you look at The Case Against Q is his leading book on this. But he's written many other things. Uh, and I, I've looked at this, and, and I have to say, after all my research, I, I have to agree that the, the argument for Q is just really terrible. Uh, there, there really isn't any good argument for Q. Uh, and the, the theory that Luke is just redacting Mark and Matthew explains a lot more data uh, than the Q hypothesis does. And now there are the people who, there are a lot of us in the scholarly community who agree with this, the fact that Q doesn't exist. Um, but I'd say we're still a minority, you know, maybe one out of every three. So it's like, there's still like this old guard that's really insistent on defending Q. Although, uh, Kloppenborg is one of the big leading defenders of Q. Even he had to admit like in one of his defense, try, trying really hard to defend the Q. He says, well, he basically said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically says like 50-50 as to whether there was a Q or not. It's like, okay, you're almost giving up on Q at that point. Uh, so I, I think, you know, Q is a hypothetical document. 
we don't have it. We don't even have really concrete evidence that it ever existed. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to use. And yet a lot of scholars have these grandiose theories about what was in Q, how it was redacted over time, really elaborate theories. As to, and this explains all kinds of things they want to say about the origins of Christianity. But it's all built on this facade of hypothesis on top of hypothesis on top of hypothesis on top of hypothesis. Very little evidence backs it. So, uh, so I don't really support the existence of Q, and I don't think it's useful as evidence to really treat that hypothesis as if it's evidence of something. It, it, it needs evidence for it, not the other way around. Group writing of things was not a common... In fact, I can't even think of an example of it ever in ancient literature. It's always an individual composing. Um, what you have is you have an individual composes, and then someone else comes along and redacts it. Uh, so John, we know, has gone through multiple redactions. Uh, so the Gospel of John, the version we have now is not the original one written. Um, so, in fact, someone has inserted stuff, taken stuff out, and reordered it, such that you have these weird uh, illogical inconsistencies where Jesus is suddenly in one country and then suddenly he's in a different district instantly. Uh, so they've been put out of order. Or the, the, the order of things like, this is the first miracle he did, and this is the third miracle he did. They have those in the wrong order. Uh, so someone's moved it around. Someone's added some stuff. There's two endings to John. There's one ending and then there's another ending tacked on. Uh, we don't know which one is the original, which one was added later. Uh, and so all the experts who've written uh, treatises on the Gospel of John have pointed out that, that the John we have is not the John that was originally written. Someone's meddled with it. At least one redaction has occurred, uh, and possibly more than one. Uh, so in that sense, there are multiple authors of John, but it wasn't in the sense that it was multiple authors collaborating together. It was authors in fucking with each other's work, <laughs> basically. Now, the ending of John, or the last ending of John, if that's uh, the um, if it, that's the one that was tacked on at the end, it does have a we. It says we uh, basically are the authors of this book, and we are relying on this other character's uh, previous writings or whatever, which is totally made up. Uh, but I think that's whoever wrote that is probably a particular individual representing a community. So I don't think it was actually literally multiple authors were sitting down and, and redacting John. I think it was one person, but he's seeing himself as a we, as, as, a, as representative of a collective. Like, we don't like this earlier redaction. We're going to, like, pop it up and, like, change this stuff. Uh, and so, like, yeah, so we got this stuff from this, this other magical earlier document uh, that I'm personally fairly certain never existed, uh, but that's how they're selling it. Uh, so, I, so, yeah, there, there's... There's really no such thing as collaborative document writing in the ancient world, as far as I can think of, uh, and probably wasn't for the Gospels. But it, it is this kind of redaction over time, meddling with by different authors, editors. Why is there this obsession to stick with a historical Jesus rather than admitting that maybe there wasn't one? Even just to admit that maybe there wasn't one rather than just saying there wasn't one, right? You could say like, yeah, okay, it's possible there wasn't one. And I've had some leading scholars in the field like tell me privately like, yeah, actually I'm, I'm not really convinced like it's 50-50, like maybe there wasn't one. But I really can't like publicly say that because that would be damaging to my career. People would make fun of me. It would be, you know, cause problems for me essentially. So there's still this sort of field pressure against people to like, no, don't go there. Don't ever go there. And I think, so there's partly that. And there's this lesson to have learned. A lot of these scholars who are thinking like this saw what happened to Thomas Thompson in the 70s. Thomas Thompson is a professor of the Old Testament, and he's the first one to come out with a peer-reviewed study claiming, hey, Moses and Abraham and the patriarchs are mythical. They didn't exist. And the effort to destroy his career was phenomenal. So there was like all kinds of things within the field like to get him disinvited, get him kicked out of conferences, to get his papers not reviewed, to not, like, prevent him from getting a job anywhere. And so he went through a lot of crap over that, like really problematic crap. And pe people in the field still remember that having happened. And so when you, you say, well, now you're writing like Jesus didn't exist. I'm not going on that third rail because look what happened to Thomas Thompson. I'm not going there. Uh, and you have you know people within re the religious universities are in worse shape because they definitely can't go there. You have the example of Thomas Brody who wrote you know, a memoir, he's a, a Catholic priest, and he wrote a memoir saying, I don't think Jesus existed. And the Vatican said, okay, yeah, you're retired now. You can't, don't get to talk about this anymore. We're, you're going to shut up. And so they silenced him, and he's gone now. He's, you know, off in some retirement community, uh, not, not holding a position anymore, and not allowed to talk to anybody, as far as we know. Uh, so uh, that was the end of that. Uh, so you have this, 
you know, within the religious communities, it's even worse. But even within the secular community, like if you're a biblical studies professor, who's your audience? Where is your grant money coming from? Where is your departmental uh, funding coming from? It's coming from Christians and Christian institutes. And so there's, you don't want to like rock that boat. The scholars who can come out and say, I doubt Jesus existed, or at least I'm not convinced he did, are scholars who are insulated from being harmed uh, or, or have realized they are. I think a lot of more, I think a lot more scholars are immune to being harmed than they think they are. I think a lot of scholars think they're in more danger uh, than they are, and that keeps them quiet. Uh, but some have, have come out and said, yeah, actually, I am kind of a doubter of this. And so you have Hector Avalos, you have Art Droge, you have Kurt Knoll, you have a variety of these you know, professors in the field who have come out and say, yeah, actually, I do doubt the historicity of Jesus. But there are people who are, that can't be punished, essentially. So they're, they're in there, so you have to look at other people. Uh, so that's a, that's a factor. But I think it's also a factor that careers are built on the historicity of Jesus. Like, it's going to be really difficult to, like, switch around and say, actually, I'm going to repudiate all of my life's work and say that, actually, I was wrong about everything about the origins of Christianity else because I think there's no Jesus. That can be very difficult personally to do. Uh, there's uh, some people in the field have, you know, they're married to people who would be very upset if they were to suggest that there was not a Jesus anymore. So there's a lot of these things. But it's also kind of like, um, and this is said about Q, for example, um, that Q is a juggernaut, that it's uh, that there's so much invested in it uh, that no one is willing to like admit that it doesn't exist. They're so bought into this hypothesis that they just won't listen to any reason and say, like, I don't care what the evidence says, I'm convinced there was a Q, and how dare you suggest there's not. Uh, I think the historicity of Jesus has become that too. Like there's this institutional fossilization is like, well, of course that's the mainstream. Everything else is ridiculous. La, la, la. I'm not going to listen to the challenging of this. How dare we go there? Uh, so there's that kind of institutional inertia, I think, is also a problem uh, for why this happens. When you look at like the Jesus seminar, why are they so invested in there being a historical Jesus, even when they're willing to admit most of the stuff about him is made up? Like if, if you're willing to say most of it's made up, why aren't you just go all the way and say, well, if most of it's made up, maybe all of it's made up. Uh, so why, why don't they go there? But a lot of the members of the Jesus Seminar aren't necessarily secular. They're liberal believers. They're, they're Christians, and they have these ideas. So you have like John Dominic Crossan, for example, has this idea of Jesus that actually matches what he wants to preach in terms of the moral universe, like what, what moral message he wants to preach. So it becomes important that this is really how Jesus even became historicized in the first place, is that if your hero doesn't exist, it's a much harder sell to say that he's the great moral guide for something. Oh, you mean someone made him up? That's the great moral guide? But if he's real and really said and did the things that you say he said and did, you can say like, oh, look, he is a real moral authority. And so it has more weight, has more psychological effect on people and on yourself, right? So if you want to model yourself after this guy, it's easier to model yourself after someone you believe existed after, than after a fictional character, let's say. It's not that no one can do that. It's just that it's, it's easier for a lot of people to, to, to do that if they believe in the, the historicity of that person. And that's how Moses gets historicized, for example, is why Moses is so important and why Abraham is so important. And the same thing with Jesus. Uh, and so I think there are a lot of scholars who really invested in historicity because they're invested in the theo some theology, some idea of, of what, they, what they understand Jesus to have been. And there's, there have been other scholars who pointed out that when they look at this huge diversity of theories of who the historical Jesus was, there's like tons of different versions of Jesus, tons of different versions of what he really taught originally and stuff. What, uh, what someone said is like, what, what I've noticed is when you look at a scholar and you look at his politics and you look at his, uh, what he wants to be true religiously, and then you look at the Jesus he's re reconstructed, it's conveniently the same. Uh, and so this is like, what seems to be happening is that people are looking down a well and seeing themselves reflected back at them and then calling it Jesus, really, right? So, so you have this, this trend in scholarship to build your historical Jesus to be the one you want for your own politics and for your own moral uh, vision for society. And, and of course, that keeps you anchored to defending historicity because you need historicity to do that. So, uh, so that's kind of a, a still a barrier for people. But there are a lot of people who are willing to say, you know, actually, there's no reconstruction of Jesus that makes sense to me now. And it's the same problem that the original Christians had with Moses and Abraham and Homer. It's like those documents, those the morals that were they were teaching are like thousands of years old or hundreds of years old. They no longer speak to our current generation. So they rewrite, they create their gospels and have Jesus be the version that they want. We're now in the same place. Like the, the, the Jesus that's in the Gospels is no longer resonates today. He, he's, he, if you actually read the Gospels, he's kind of a dick. Uh, he's super moralistic. He, he doesn't really fit in. He doesn't have a lot to say to our current generation and, and the kind of moral struggles we're dealing with now. I think what you're going to see is that the new guard is going to be more free to be open about this. 
And you're gonna see the old guard die off and you're gonna see uh, probably more and more acceptance of this, at least the plausibility that Jesus didn't exist. Uh, not necessarily like adopting the hypothesis that he didn't, but at least saying, yeah, that's as plausible as the zealot hypothesis that's you know also going on in the field or the, or the you know apocalyptic prophet hypothesis or the ma Jesus the magician hypothesis or Jesus, Jesus the cynic hypothesis. There's all of these different hypotheses about the historical Jesus the non-existent hypothesis, this other alternative theory for the origins of Christianity, is at least as plausible as all those others. Uh, and so it deserves a equal respect and a place at the table of the debate.